I'm joined once again by my scientific co-host of tonight, Isabella Rocchietta, for the first challenge of this night. So our experts and yourself will address, address the treatment of an infected implant in the aesthetic area and answer this. When is it time to remove? So Isabella, what can you tell us about that? Garrett, once again, hello, good evening. Uh, the challenge of tonight is a real challenge. The challenge is how to treat an infected implant by parimplantitis in the aesthetic zone. And I like to say, Garrett, that it's a challenge not only from a clinician's point of view, because we are faced with what are we going to do in cases where the aesthetics is clearly compromised, but most of it, it's the function. Mm -hmm. But it's also a challenge for the patient. The patient has spent a lot of money. The patient has gone through a set of surgeries to do this. And now we are telling him or her that something is failing. Not an easy decision. Not an easy decision. And Thankfully, we have two extraordinary experts in the field, and I'm very honored to introduce the speakers. Anne-Marie Rose Jansica, she is a specialist in periodontology, past president of the Swedish Society of Periodontology. And most importantly, her thesis, uh, named Long to Time Follow-up of Dental Implants and Treatment of Perimplantitis, received a huge international attention when perimplantitis was not so noticed back in 2007. I remember that time. But not everybody knows that she is a black belt in karate, <laughs> Anne-Marie. So Anne -Marie. I, would, I would say let's be careful tonight. Welcome. Yes. Thank Our so second guest tonight is Raffaele Cavalcanti, a dear friend and active member and treasurer of the Italian Society of Periodontology and Implantology. He is the chairman of the Italian ITI section and he is currently adjunct professor at the, at, of periodontology at the University of Catania. And I digged a little bit into, <laughs> you have another fun into, fact. into, into his... Uh, his uh, hobbies and apparently he's um, he would love to be a gourmet chef but apparently he doesn't even know how to fry an egg which i don't know how that's possible but for the sake of his wife he once won the first prize at a cooking competition oh well rafaela welcome and uh, here's your first challenge of the night cook an egg yes. no it's a cooking joke. an egg <laughs> Now, let's go back to being uh, serious, and I wanted to start sharing our two major cases tonight. We see on the screen Eva. Eva is a Swedish middle-aged patient who is clearly suffering, uh, quite severely, I would like to say, with a central incisor affected by perimplantitis. We had, we had then uh, a second case. Her name is Laura, and she's an Italian patient affected by an aesthetically interesting you know, um, uh, issue here. And certainly we will have to dig into how to treat these two patients. I'd like to show you the two radiographs because we're very lucky because we have selected purposely two same site cases in order to, in a way, speak and dig into the treatment options. And I think this is the moment when we can ask our audience what they would do. Exactly, we would like to really engage you during this challenge of the night so you can vote again. And if this is the first time you come across this, it's done in the same way as during the battle and the Is It True earlier tonight. You can scan the QR code, which is appearing on your screen right now, should be appearing. And if you can't find it or you're too late, you also find that same code, uh, code right below the live stream player. And please vote in this case of Eva and Laura, what would you do? Keep the implant or remove the implant. Yes. Implant. Later on, we'll see how the audience is voting. Correct. So I say that we start um, digging into Eva, and I would like to ask our first expert, Anne Marie, what would you, um, how would you approach a case like Eva? Can you tell us a little bit more about her? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm very, I'm very honoured, and I look forward to the challenge. Uh, what you see here is. Uh, a a visible sign of uh, inflammation with uh, redness and swelling of the mucosa. Uh, and also we see uh, on the radiograph bone loss. Uh, but I think if you look closer, the crown at uh, number two one is wider than the crown at number one one. And that is because uh, the clinician uh, choose to do the crown wider to take care uh, of the 
big diastema that in fact had troubled the patient for many years before she lost the tooth. So maybe a dental implant wasn't the best decision in an aesthetic way. However, now we have a problem with um, periimplantitis. Uh, she is in good general health, no big medication, she's a non-smoker. Uh, she has a history of uh, periodontitis, uh, however, now the big problem is the uh, implant. With nine millimeters of pocket depth, bleeding and probing, and pus. Uh, if we look around to the teeth, there are only a few sites with four millimeter pocket and minimal bleeding. So I will say that the, there is quite stable situation uh, in the, uh, around the teeth. However, she has an overall plaque index of 78%. Uh, and we know a history of periodontitis and uh, a non-optimal uh, plaque control or risk factors for uh, periimplantitis. So uh, I offer her two options, to keep the implant or in fact, I wanted to remove it since I have some concern about how would my uh, surgical approach be with su success uh, since there is maybe as much as 50% of bone loss and also um, uh, it is a rough implant surface and it's tapered. Mm. Uh, so I tell her the risks and uh, the costs and uh, uh, she wants to keep the implant. Mm. She has paid a lot of money for it and she wants to keep it. Uh, I tell her that there could be recessions and even uh, recurrent perimplantitis. But uh, she says that is the risk I can take. I want to get rid of the inflammation if it's, uh, uh, that's okay for me. Uh, so I offer her uh, to uh, uh, take part in a, in a research study where we have a surgical approach with or without regenerative surgery. So looking at uh, the other... The yes. next image, yes. yes. Uh, this is just before uh, starting uh, the surgery. Uh, you see pus and bleeding and uh, an open flap with a huge amount of uh, granular t uh, tissue. And also when I remove that, you can see calculus. Uh, and the next, next picture, uh, I clean the surface uh, uh, mechanically with, uh, with, from calculus, and then I use a titanium brush, a 3% peroxide, uh, rinse with saline, and uh, then I have uh, non-resorbable sutures. Uh, after two weeks, they are removed, and uh, then there are six-week uh, oral hygiene follow-up, and then there are supportive therapy, a strict uh, schedule every third month. And at 12 months, and also at 15 months, you can see that uh, there are no clinical signs of inflammation. There are firm mucosa. There are no deep pockets, no bleeding on probing. So the success in taking care of the inflammation, yes. but there are recession, and I wanted to do soft tissue augmentation but the patient is satisfied. She hadn't uh, the money to pay, and she is satisfied with the result. Well, very interesting, uh, Anne-Marie. It's, it's, it certainly answers the question on whether we can achieve um, you know, a, a condition, a stable condition, yes. at least with this follow-up. And if we take the next picture, we can see that at the one-year follow-up, at the radiograph, there are even uh, bone fill uh, and we know it's bone fill, bone regeneration, since there are no grafting. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. And it, it's um, Lello or Raffaele, apologize. Can I call you like a friend or yes. <laughs> with your formal name? Would you have treated this in the same way? Honestly, no. It's I'm a challenge. I'm afraid so telling this because uh, Anne-Marie uh, is a black belt. Uh, I know. You should be uh, very I, scared I, I about this. Want, I'm, af I'm afraid. I, I'm scared to fight with her, but uh, uh, my uh, choice uh, would have been uh, totally different. Implant removal for several reasons. Interesting. So if you think that the implant removal is the treatment of choice for several reasons in, in that case, what about Laura? Laura? 
what about Laura? She is, she is your patient and can you tell us a little bit more about yes. her? Laura is my patient. Uh, she is a young woman, 35 years old, and she received that implant uh, a few years before, four, four to five years before. She came uh, with this clinical situation. Uh, she uh, visited uh, uh, other dentists around Italy for uh, uh, consultation and came to ask our, uh, our opinion and our possible treatment plan with a specific demand uh, uh, to recover her aesthetic appearance at any cost. Okay. So uh, probably uh, this request uh, made our choice that has been stronger easier. But we also uh, consider the other aspect that we were speaking about. Okay. First of all, that the implant was not placed by us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that <laughs> usually makes it easier. <laughs> easier than the implant position. If we um, look at uh, the other uh, pictures, we can see the overall tissue deficiency, uh, uh, both at uh, hard tissue level and uh, at soft tissue level. And uh, if we look at the CT scan taken by the patient uh, uh, at her uh, first visit, we can see that we have a major bone resorption on the buccal aspect. Bone resorption plus Bleeding probing and separation, as Anne Marie told, uh, is the definition of perimplantitis. So we have a, a uh, an implant affected by perimplantitis, but is also a malpositioned implant. So the, the implant angulation and also the implant size uh, can really uh, make us very, very difficult to save and to keep this implant. So our decision was, uh, and uh, we can see in the next image, to first remove the implant. First step, surgical step, uh, uh, implant removal. And as you can see uh, in the next picture, after implant removal, we tried only to promote the superficial soft tissue healing by means of placing a collagen matrix in uh, the, the bone defect to support a connective tissue graft and to try to get at 10, 12 weeks, as you can see uh, in the lower image, uh, a, a quite good soft tissue healing. So we try to simplify this treatment, transforming an implant removal in a type two implant, uh, type two slash three implant placement uh, like we do when we remove a tooth. We waited 10, 12 weeks and then, as you can see uh, in, in, um, in this video, uh, we went for the second surgery. Second surgery was uh, 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 dedicated to implant placement, as you can see here, uh, classical flap elevation for a coronal, uh, coronally advanced flap uh, with vertical incision. Implant placement by means of guided surgery because this option uh, make me work in a more comfortable way. It takes five minutes for me to place the implants, then to check the proper position in an uh, apical coronal direction, and then perform uh, the peri-implant GBR, the lateral bone augmentation, different layers, as we can saw before by Danny Buzer, this is the approach by uh, the yeah. School uh, of Bern. Flap closure, submerging the implant, and then, as you can see uh, later, we waited four months, and uh, in the next video, uh, you can look at uh, the, the implant uh, second stage, the implant connection. And this time, the flap elevation was quite similar than before, but it was a, a full, a complete, uh, f split thickness flap. You can see the periosteum. We checked the, the implant uh, surrounding tissue and we decided to further augment the soft tissue profile by means of placing a new collagen matrix. Then after the suture, we waited a few weeks. Uh, uh, this is a semi-submerged healing uh, 
So the prostodontist, after a few weeks, three, four weeks, had the possibility to start <laughs> with his job. The prostodontist, in this case, is uh, Piero Venezia. And uh, uh, he started to uh, place a, pro uh, uh, a fixed provisional restoration, then started to uh, condition the soft tissue. And you can uh, appreciate the final result uh, the final radiograph, the, this is the radiograph at one year follow-up, and the comparison between the baseline at the end of, uh, uh, of the procedures, of the treatment, uh, with a further uh, one year follow-up uh, that you can see in this final image. So I understand that you have shown and treated Eva and Laura in clearly two diametrically opposite uh, ways. Anne-Marie, would you have treated Laura in the same way? Absolutely not. Great. Why? <laughs> She's preparing the, <laughs> yeah. black, uh, the black belt move. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why? No, because uh, if, if, as I see it, there is even less uh, bone loss around uh, Laura's implant. And uh, you show that uh, you are, of course, a great surgeon. And I think if you have uh, modified the crown and uh, used uh, the same technique with, uh, with uh, soft tissue augmentation, maybe we would have a, a, as good a result, uh, result. However, the supportive therapy and the oral hygiene is the key to success uh, in a long time. Let me say that I disagree yes. a little bit uh, because anyway, even uh, with the wonderful surgery uh, that we have, uh, uh, have seen yesterday, for instance, uh, we can rebuild soft tissue, we can cover uh, exposed titanium surfaces, but that implant will remain a malpositioned implant. So with some critical aspect that can affect the long-term result. Uh, I think. But, Raffaele, if the same implant Laura had was affected by perimplantitis but not, but positioned in the correct 3D position, would you follow what Anne Marie is saying? Would you, would you keep it cleaning the surface and using the connective tissue graft and changing the crown, or would you still go through the process of extracting the implant? And Marie's result was wonderful, and she was very skilled in minimizing the soft tissue recession and shrinkage. But anyway, we know that uh, cutting these type of tissues that are scar tissues, mm. uh, uh, we could expect uh, tissue recession and uh, uh, a residual implant, uh, uh, um, the complex implant crown exposure. So in a patient with such high expectations with a special request, yeah. I want to uh, gain again yes. my aesthetic appearance. Uh, I think that uh, there was no way then uh, remove the implants and go through complex procedures and also cost effective procedures. Mm. Exactly, because I've seen that removal of the implant has many interventions, costly, and long time of healing for the patient, which means a high compliance and a high request from the Absolutely. patient. And I saw that you went through two, twice, connective tissue grafting. Anne-Marie, how would you comment about this connective tissue? Is it always mandatory when we're treating perimplantitis affected implants? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, you, you must look into the patient, the patient's ex expectations. And we have, uh, Raphael and I, t totally two different patients. One with highly aesthetic demands. Uh, and no uh, bothering about the costs. And, and my patients, who is in fact satisfied with the crown on number uh, two one, it's, that's wider. And she says it's even better than before when I had a bigger di diastema and no concerns about the, the um, uh, recession. However, I wanted to aug augment. And uh, I, I know that you have augmented a case, yes. and we can see it uh, at the yes. moment. I'm not sure if the yes, audience so the, can see it. This uh, is, uh, is nearly the same. It's uh, not a perfect positioned implant, and there was peri-implantitis to half the implant length, length, and I treated it with only open flap debridement, cleaning with 3% uh, peroxide mm -hmm. and saline, and closed it. 
one year is the baseline, one year of the perimplantitis surgery, yes. we have a little fistula, not a pathological fistula, it's more like because there are exposed threads under. So I do uh, a free um, connective tissue graft, grafting, and after one year, you see the thickness, and after 20 years, it's still stable. And we know the thickness, uh, as we have talked about, Rafael and I, uh, of the connective tissue, and the tissue is I, important. Uh, I have a question related to what you have just said. The open flap debridement, we have seen that you have gained a successful result when it comes to health. So we're not talking about aesthetics now. Let's focus a little bit on the health of the infected implant. But how, how can we pr be predictable? What is the long-term predictability of an open flap debridement procedure on an infected implant? Can you let me know your thoughts based on the literature? Yes, we have, we have uh, up to five year, even seven year result uh, that's a little bit lower than 100%, but 100% after one year, and then it's 75 to nearly 100%. But this is in patients that, that are in a strict yeah. supportive uh, uh, maintenance program, and uh, where we focus on the oral hygiene and um, the patient cooperate. Lalo, would you? Uh, I uh, agree about this point, as we know the different treatment modalities and procedures, conservative, uh, open flap, regenerative procedure can help us to recover peri-implant uh, health. One, uh, so peri-implant health is, is something uh, that can be obtained, but it's something that also needs to be maintained. Mm -hmm. So supportive therapy is uh, mandatory, is the key factor, and supportive therapy as uh, oral, uh, 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 home, uh, at home uh, oral hygiene is something that is more easy if we have uh, an implant that is well positioned, a prosthetic restoration that is uh, uh, well designed and uh, can guarantee easy access to, to plaque removal. So I understand it's a multifactorial, obviously, approach. And um, one of the questions that I had was, in the case of Eva, if you had considered to remove the crown to be able to access and clean very well. Do we have the yeah, same? Yeah, this is actually a, a viewer question, very nice. Uh, in the case of Eva, why did you take the decision to leave the crown? Roberto Rodriguez from Peru is writing. Yeah. Uh, because it was cemented, so I couldn't remove it. And I felt that uh, I could get access, uh, access anyway. Uh, and we have, of course, uh, the result, uh, but I always remove if it's screw retained uh, reconstructions. Exactly. And uh, al also I try to, to submerge if it's, if it's possible. It's interesting if we look at the voting results. I was going to uh, ask yeah, 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 yeah. you, let's, you, let's see what the... the I guess the op it, it is a real proper uh, case selection because you were both disagreeing on what you would have done. And here we see that the audience is voting, in the first case, the strong majority on removing the implant now. And we, you already explained, she was very strict about it. This had to stay. It was not an option for you. And then actually, <laughs> Rafaela, in the second case, the big majority of the audience actually <laughs> vote we should have kept the implant. So maybe in our final five minutes, we should provide them some yes. clarification to really understand why you went, well, in your case, it's mainly the patient, but what can we learn here? Uh, w uh, we can learn that uh, uh, probably uh, the, we, we are to interpret every situation case by case and uh, with a sort of uh, multi-level analysis. So the patient and the patient profile, the patient habits, then the, the local situation, the local environment for me uh, um, is different. My approach, uh, if I have to treat uh, such a situation in an aesthetic area or in a posterior area, in a posterior area, I'm more prone to try to keep yeah. an implant. In an aesthetic area with uh, that, uh, those specific demands by the patient, I, I think that there was no solution. Mm -hmm. Then uh, l l let me add one thing. Uh, we are speaking about uh, the um, uh, soft tissue uh, add, uh, added value to our procedure. Of course, no discussion that uh, bone must be there and soft tissue can only increase t 
tissue stability, uh, especially for our long-term results. So I think that, that in order to summarize and to conclude, we understand that these two options are in fact very different and they have to be taken, con taking in consideration a lot of factors and sub-factors. First one of which is clearly the aesthetic demand mm -hmm. or the aesthetic appearance, because we perfectly know that the open flap debridement or even other approaches when keeping the implants may end up with a recession of the soft tissues. Am I summarizing your, your take on messages? But on the other hand, if the aesthetics is important, we have to outweigh where the implant is, at the, so the, the implant level, the patient level, the maintenance and the compliance and so forth to be able to take a decision. Because I must say, Rafaela, you're a very skilled surgeon, but clearly the moment you extract that implant, in a way you almost have to guarantee that your next approach will be successful and will be better. Of course. So we Absolutely. also have to put on the, on the, on the weight uh, and on the balance this this aspect. Absolutely, and I just want to say that uh, the best thing is to have a good treatment plan from the beginning, to insert the implant in, a, in an optimal way, optimal way, have a, a already a clear maintenance program, and uh, of course, uh, diagnose early uh, and treat yeah. early uh, signs of inflammation, so the patient uh, doesn't have to um, have more more treatment and even more suffer in the in the future and you're saying and we don't let it even even come this far oh, right you should yes. have already in your treatment plan and in your follow-up prevent that we end up with a case yes. like this yes and perhaps also looking at the question that uh, jose pedro martinez is asking about how we decontaminate the rough surfaces of the implants perhaps our energy and research should focus, and, and I'm seeing around improvements on how to effectively clean the surface, the rough surface of the implants, because I think that that is one of the many crucial factors that will lead us towards one solution or another. Unfortunately, we would need to stay here for hours and we hours. We could do another one and we talk <laughs> deeper about cleaning and advancements because it sounds that in the future we might have advancements where we will be longer able to keep implants in these kind of situations. Why that's not? What you say. Exactly. Well, with that, we hit already 11 o'clock, so that's already time to thank you for the last time of the night, Isabella Roquette. Thank, you, thank you, for being my scientific co-host and thank Thank you to both of you for being here, being the challenge and uh, bringing these interesting cases. What an interesting session.